I'd like to talk to you about how to set up the band, assuming you don't know how to do it, a jazz band. Do not set up a band first, second, third in a line, left to right, right to left. We set up the players in the band, I'm talking about the horn section, lead is in the middle, and then it splays out from the middle. Okay. If this is your saxophone section and you're looking at the band from the audience, lead alto, second alto, lead tenor, second tenor, Barry. Or sometimes you'll see in charts it'll be one, two, three, four, Barry. Sometimes you'll see one, two, one, two, tenor, Barry. They write it differently for different publishers. But the lead goes in the middle. And if you get to the trombone section, it's like this. Tallest finger here is lead, lead bone, second, third, fourth. Trumpet section is the same way. Lead, second, third, fourth. And the reason is the lead player sets the way all the phrasing goes and everybody needs to hear. So the lead isn't set up based on one end or the other. The lead is set up in the middle so they can dictate and then everyone else can hear it. So remember that because understanding why it needs to be set up will help you remember the setup. Just don't set it up. And the thing is, I'm going to give you the basic, basic, basic setup. When you play with professionals, you can set the band up any way you want because professionals can play it right. They know their role. They... <sighs> Doesn't get better. But anyway, professionals, you could, you could put them in any order and they'll play it right. It's just easier to hear this way. From the crowd, it works out really well. And the thing is, you put your... Let's look at the trombone section. First, second, third, fourth, which is bass bone. That goes to the right of the band. If you're looking at the band from the front, the Barry Sachs goes to the right of the band if you're looking at it from the front. And that must have come from the traditional way big bands were set up before they had microphones. Because you would hear a band, and on the right side you would hear the roots of the chord, and on the left side you'd hear the rhythm section with the bass, and it must have given the band a fuller sound. But once microphones came in, you can flip it any way you want. So what I'm telling you is a basic way, even though you can turn on YouTube and you can find 15 ways that they play with it. A lot of times bands would set up in a fancy V to make it look good. That's all fine. But if you have a band and you're just starting out, I stay away from that. The rhythm section is, is a little different. What I like to do and what a lot of people like to do is get the drum set set up where the front of the bass drum is in line with the trombone stands. A lot of times what happens is the drummer comes in late because he has a lot of equipment. He or she has a lot of equipment. And what happens is they wind up setting up where there's just where there's room left. And you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. The drums need to be in there because it gives a better feel for the time. And if the drums are up in the band, the trumpets have a peripheral view of the drummer playing and that actually helps time-wise some of the phrasing. So keep that in mind, get the drums up. The bass player likes to be near the ride cymbal. The ride cymbal, if your drummer's right-handed, is right there. So it's going to be drums tucked into the horns. Bass player, piano player is kind of like off to, from the drums, maybe off at, at two, a 1 o'clock, 1.30, 2 o'clock position, and then the two o'clock position to the drummer and then the, the guitar is usually tucked right in there in front of the drums and uh, by the piano. The important thing about the rhythm section is they should have eye contact with each other. That's really important because the rhythm section can get into a lot of different shaping and phrasing when they play behind a soloist. So keep that in mind. Uh, and some of the bands that use the typical, they very rarely get too fancy. If you look at Buddy Rich's band on YouTube, nine times out of ten, it's the traditional setup. Basie's band, usually the traditional setup. Uh, Thad Jones, if you look at Thad and Mel's band, nine, time, nine times out of ten in the video clips that are up today, you'll see that typical setup. But understand this lead thing in the middle. Don't do this. One, two, three, one, two, three. Don't do that. It's in the middle and it splays out. And this setup is good. This setup is good for a band to play uh, uh, or for an audience to hear the band play. What it's bad for is rehearsing. And <sighs> see, when life gives you a left turn, this straightens it out. Anyway, what was I saying? He always does this to me. Oh, oh. 
When I rehearse bands, initially, at least maybe for the first half of our rehearsal time, I like to set up in a box and have everybody face in. So, if you look at the traditional big band setup, I'll have the saxes turn around, have the trumpet section back up a little bit, and have the trombone section come out and go off to the side. And the rhythm section turns in. So, the saxes are facing the trumpets, the trombone section is facing the rhythm section, and they play towards the middle. And the good thing about that is if you're a, if you're a saxophone player, you can hear yourself better. Because a lot of times saxophones are, you have eight brass behind, you can't hear too well. And if you get that off of you, you can kind of hear how you fit. The trombones can hear the saxes, and they can hear the rhythm section differently. The trumpets get to hear the whole chart, because the trumpet sections are in the back, and a lot of times when I do this setup, I hear it from the trumpet section. I had no idea that was going on. So, it, it, you know, when they hear the saxophones play something. So what that does is that gets everybody to learn the chart. And in young bands and beginning bands, that's pretty good. That's, that's a good thing. Uh, and I would maybe do that if I had a month to prepare for a concert. Maybe for the first two and a half weeks, I would set up in this box. I would just make sure that everybody heard all the charts. And then, then you have to get used to, to performing in the setup that you're, you're going to actually perform in. I'm trying to see how much time I have left. Oh, I'm okay. So, maybe the, uh, a, a week and a half or two weeks before a concert, I'll set everybody up in the, in the setup so they learn what it's going to sound like when you play live, but uh, when you play a live concert. But this looking at each other, they do that a lot when they record. Uh, when we record in a recording studio, you know, we'll set up in different rooms in a recording studio. But keep that in mind. Now, we talk about this learn by sound business. And uh, when you listen to a recording, what will happen is it can be different each time you listen to it, depending on what you're listening for. You can have a saxophone player listen to how the lead alto player played, or how the lead alto player scooped in this uh, soli section. Uh, the lead trumpet player can study how this fellow played uh, the cutoffs or the tongue stops, or how he swelled on a sforzando. Uh, there's a lot that can happen. The, uh, I've had bass players actually study the bass line, uh, like you would take a bass line from a small group. So learning by sound isn't just let's listen and play, Learning by sound is like you're a detective, and you really get in there, and you can, you can learn how to play lead. You can learn how to play Barry Sax, which will flip from playing with bass, playing with the saxes, playing with the bones. Once you, you know what to listen for, there is always something to be learned from a recording. Even if you just listen and you don't pay much attention, you're probably going to learn something. But if you know what you're after... And it really helps the lead players. This, it goes back to that learn by sound thing. So keep that in mind because when you get the setup happening and you understand why the setup needs to be the way it is, why, why everyone sits in a certain spot and everyone has a different role. Maybe at one point we'll go through each member of the band and, and talk about the different role of each member. But for right now, that's going to be a bit too much. I mean, traditionally, when you had a, a trumpet section, you had trumpet one, two, three, four. The second trumpet was the soloist, and he sat right next to the rhythm section. And in the sax section, we had alto one, alto two, tenor one, tenor two, Barry. It was usually the tenor player that had all the solos. And you don't see that too much now, because now everybody solos. You have a whole band. Listen to Thad Jones, Mel Lewis, or Buddy Will, any band, any great band. Everybody solos. They all solo great you know, for the most part. So, you don't have to worry about this too much. Once microphones came in, it changed the game. It didn't change this game, one, two, three, four, but it made it so you can flip things around. You'll see Woody Herman's band with three tenor saxophones in it and a Barry. You'll see a saxophone section with two Barry saxes. They experimented like crazy, but I'm just giving you the basic idea. So remember, this is the reason, right here is the reason why you want to set up with your lead person in the middle. Get your drums tucked in the front of the bass drum along with the, the, the stands, the music stands in the trombone section. And uh, make sure the rhythm section can see each other. Have your lead people listen to the recording and understand their job. 
because they have to over exaggerate everything so everyone else can get underneath and this is like the next step in learning by sound with an ensemble so be careful of your setup don't just don't set up like you would uh, you know another ensemble jazz is we tuck the lead in the middle because they state it and everybody needs to hear it okay See, it's a, it's again. I shouldn't even shut it off. How much time we have?